What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 627. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado for 10 years, Luis, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Have you seriously been there for 10 years or are you just messing with me? I, I mean, I, I am technically four months shy of that, but yeah, it's been that still counts. It's been about a decade, which is crazy because it just it doesn't feel like yesterday, but it also feels like I don't know, probably a couple of years ago that I moved here. But no, it's uh, it's been quite some time. So, as an adult, you've lived roughly equal time in California and Denver now. Uh, well, no, because <laughs> ten and twenty five are. <laughs> I said, as an adult, Luis, when you turned uh, eighteen and became an adult. Oh, I, I, I guess I didn't, I didn't hear that part. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're right. The math checks out. Oh God. That's weird. It, it, it's weird that it feels like a short, short period of time for me, even though it was when you moved, but yeah, at any rate, uh, welcome to the show, Luis. It's nice to see you. How are you doing? Oh, I, I am doing great. Um, yeah. What's going on? Not much. Had the, had the set championship last week, you know, started O2 and rattled, rallied back to a 10-5 finish, which I wasn't too unhappy about. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty solid. And then, um, yeah, that was nice. Okay. Kind of just looking forward to the holidays coming up. That's a, that's a, that's mostly it. That's right. We've got a whole lot uh, lined up on the show this week for you. We have a special guest who I'll bring in in just a minute. Uh, and we have uh, kind of a slew of different topics uh, to cover including the draft open, which happened. Um, and, uh, I'm going to go on a rant. I got some, I got some, got a chip on my shoulder. We're going to get off of here and we're going to talk Love it. data, which, uh, might give you a little hint as our, as who our special guest is. First though, let's mention our sponsors, channelfireball.com. It's a place to go really for anything you need magic related. You know, they changed over to the marketplace now, which is, it's a different way to sell singles. It basically allows, uh, smaller shops to put their singles up on channel fireball. And that means when you go to buy singles, you're going to have access to a lot more, uh, stock, right? There's just way more available for you to browse through. And of course that means that you can find what you want in the condition you want. You can even, uh, do price comparisons on the fly to get the best deal possible, but you're still backed up by CFB, right? That it's still going through channel fireball, which is a, a trusted source somewhere that, you know, you've been going to for years. So you kind of get the best of both worlds there. And if you do need anything for the holidays, you know, if you're looking for presents or anything like that for the holidays, head on over to channel fireball. They've got all types of good stuff for your favorite magic player in your life, whether it's a friend or a relative, or I won't tell anybody if it's for you. And, uh, you know, you can pick up something sweet for the holidays. If you do end up getting anything uh, over at Channel Fireball, if you use the affiliate code LR at checkout, you just punch it into the little box. It lets them know that we sent you over and it helps out the show. And I do appreciate it. Um, the show's also brought to you by FTX. That's the uh, regulated safe way for you to buy, sell, and trade digital assets. So these are things like cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and uh, whatever they come out with next. The blockchain technology that underpins this stuff has a lot of potential, and uh, people are constantly finding new ways to implement it and uh, to see you know, where it goes going forward. And if you want to get in on it, you can, uh, you can use FTX.us in the United States and outside of the US is FTX.com. And that'll allow you to, like I said, buy, sell and trade those various types of digital assets. I will remind you, of course, that before making an investment of any sort, make sure that you consult an investment professional. Um, the show is also brought to you by you via the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited resources. Look, this is the backbone of the show. Um, if you go there uh, and you sign up, you'll get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail at the bare minimum. Like that's the lowest level we have. And as you go up, you can get access to other things like uh, an unedited version of the show. Uh, all patrons get access to the live recording of the show. So if you happen to be around a computer, you can watch us record the show live. So hi, everybody who's doing that right now. And uh, yeah, you get all of that stuff over at the Patreon. We do want to thank everybody who supports us over there. Um, with that, let's bring in our special guest before we get to our crack a pack. Cause I want his uh, opinion on this as well. Returning to the show as he is want to do, we've been bringing him on uh, once per set to talk about data from 17 lands.com. It's Sirkovitz. Sirkovitz, Welcome back on the show. It's great to see you. I am always a pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, so thanks for inviting me again. Hopefully we can talk about the least data friendly set in living memory of me at least. 
<laughs> oh, interesting. This, this one's giving you trouble, huh? Okay, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, let's just dive into our cracker pack, and I think that that'll give us a good sense uh, for where you're at, Sirkovitz, as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, we always like to get uh, alternating opinions and stuff like that. So first one, first card out is Kindly Ancestor. That's the, the two and a white, two, three life linker that disturbs for, for one and a white. Pretty good card. Yeah, it's it's always impressed. It always just does good work. Uh, pretty happy with it, even in aggressive decks. But I think it's a little better in like the blue white flyers decks or black white life gun, of course. Yeah, you know they made the disturb cost pretty low, only one and a white to get it back. Not bad. Where are you at on uh, kindly ancestor, Sirki? Yeah, I I do like it, but I would prefer to have it in my uh, blue white deck because there I can you know use the enchantment part more efficiently because I can either put it on Brian Comer or something like that or or I can put it on fire and then the lifelink becomes a racing tool that is better than anywhere else, I think. Yeah, definitely. Next is Repository Scob. This is the three and a blue three three that ETBs with exploit and you get an instant or sorcery back if you exploit. Hasn't been great. The, the exploit mechanic's been a little difficult to make it work. You really kind of need everything to line up perfectly for it to happen and, and really be good. But, you know, you can you can randomly get back a removal spell with a repository scob every once in a while. Yeah, you yeah. can also combo it off with the Undying Malice, which is a mm -hmm. niche way of doing things. Uh, if you have other payoffs that give you some creatures when you lose a creature. Uh, that's kind of cool. Where were you at on, on the scob, Luis? I, I'm not too high on it. I, I just have found that the... <clears throat> the exploit deck and the exploit creatures are just a little bit too clunky. I think uh, an extra mana here and there just makes it maybe they need a one more cheaper cheaper effect or cheaper maybe removal spell. Or I'm not sure exactly what the piece is missing, but there's something missing. And yeah. the, the exploit cards seem about a half step behind where the format really kind of bends up. Yeah, if you want to just get cards in your hand, our next one is Scattered Thoughts. That's the three and a blue instant. Look at the top four. You get two of them and the rest go in your yard. It's a good card draw spell. Yeah, scattered thoughts can definitely pull pull you ahead if you can get to a point where you can cast it and and survive. But that's not every single deck. But I, I've liked having scattered thoughts in most of my blue decks. Yeah. Well, what do you think about think, it, Sergey? I, th I think we moved a bit far away from always beholding uh, in terms of yeah. four mana card draw. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> um, yes. I mean, I the card is okay. It's just that it requires a particular deck that will uh, benefit it better. I think that you know. I like it as a one-off in my uh, very creature-heavy blue-green decks, or um, because there, putting cards in the graveyard is actually useful if you play mainly creatures. But there's just so few spots for spells in that build that um, very often is cut for something else. It is also just a tough ask, even if it is at instant speed, to just say pay four mana, don't affect the board at all, right? It's just a little little bit uh, intensive there. Next card is uh, a real miss, Moldgraft Millipede. This is four and a green, two, two. It mills three cards when you ETB and you put a plus one, plus one counter on it for each creature card in your graveyard. Um, not pushed, right? Like this doesn't have trample or anything like that. And uh, I've never I've never seen anybody do anything with this that was interesting. Just bad. No, I, I think I, I, I could I could refer you to, to, to one of my streams when I play the Millipede mm -hmm. uh, friendly mm -hmm. deck. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a place for it. But again, you have to play really creature heavy. And um, I think that the natural tendency of people is to play uh, blue-green with that is spell intensive. And mm -hmm. I think that you have space maybe for maybe for four, five spells, and the rest should be creatures, and then it becomes actually quite good. Really? Like, I, I, you think that there's a place so where this I, is good? I, I, like, even if you told me it was a 6-6 six, six or a 7-7, seven, seven, I'm still like, mm, okay. Like, I'm still not thrilled with it. Well, if you play a lot of Lantern Bearers, which are creatures, obviously, then it becomes a 7-7 seven, seven Flyer, which is um, pretty decent. Also, I have to maybe mm. make a statement that my deck did contain the um, uh, Dolph Horror, which with Millipede is really good. Wh which card was it? Dollhouse of Horrors. When you mm. reanimate it, becomes uh, it gets still the counter, so it becomes like a six six haste, um, and and then it becomes oh, quite impressive. That, that's pretty cool, Luis. Yeah, I assume I, you've never it, cast and, a mill. And millipede. it also fuels your next uh, activation of the Dollhouse because it mills creatures into the graveyard. Yeah, that's really good. I I played it in a blue green deck that had a couple of vile spawn spiders and some mulches, and it was good. It was mm -hmm. good in that deck. I think you do want it in that deck. I mostly I've been unimpressed. I. 
I think a lot of people probably also put this card in decks where it's not good. So I've just played against a lot of like three, three millipedes or whatever. And it's just, yeah, that's not going to do a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's kind of what underpins it for me is yes, I can be an optimist and find a place for pretty much any card, but I don't want to be anywhere near the blue green deck. And that means that the millipede is homeless. You know, it just doesn't have a, like it doesn't fit into any of the other green decks. And that deck is, you know, comes up very rarely. I, I'll tell you if I'm playing, um, you know, on arena and somebody goes Island forest, I'm like, Oh, thank God. Right. Like they, you know, I'm happy, you know, cause the, it, the, I just never lose to that archetype stitched assistant is next. This one kind of missed too. This two and a blight three, a two and a blue three, two with exploit. You scry one and draw a card. Not great. Uh, I'll just move on to aim for the head. Which uh, is the the two and a black sorcery exile a zombie or exile or target opponent exiles two cards from their hand. Meh. All right, this is a decent one though. Flourishing hunter. Hey, if you're gonna be in green, four GG six six when it ETBs gain life equal to the greatest toughness among other creatures you control. It usually ends up gaining like three or four life. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. you can gain, gain even more. I mean, this is mm-hmm. this is what millipede wants to be. So <laughs> I would certainly yeah. rather start with millipede over this. You agree or with this that, over Sir millipede? Kovitz? Oh, yeah, no, I definitely would like to start with this over the Millipede because uh, obviously Millipede only fits in one archetype realistically. Yeah. Uh, just to expand on the point that you made before about the blue-green, one advantage of blue-green is that it's usually open. So uh, you will get all your spiders that will be open on the pod because it's drafted like 17 lands user drafted, I think, 3% of the time. So, so it's like severely underdrafted most of the time so if you know how to build it you will get there but yeah flourishing hunter just goes into any deck and it's way better although i still would prefer to pick it like you know pick five pick six yeah interestingly all of none of these cards i would be even remotely happy first picking so far so this pack has been (laughs) well there's a bunch of cards that you know you would call playable in some scenarios they certainly haven't been good uh next card is griff rider that's the two and a white two one flyer with training Sure. How about Epicure? Can I interest anybody in a Voldaran Epicure? For me, this is so far the best card in the pack. Oh, yeah. I do <laughs> like myself an Epicure. I'm just going back to Sirkovitz, you know, talking about Blue Green is like, yeah, that restaurant's food is terrible, but they have giant portions. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, if you can it's identify the crappy good buffet build, on the you corner. Know that it's going to be open. You you can play around it because you get consistency of getting there because you know that the cards are going to be passed, especially if you want the niche cards. Well, again, that's like saying there's no line at the restaurant either. Like you can get there every <laughs> single time and get your big pile of crappy food. But <laughs> like if you the know deck that they has to be the pieces have to dish. be there for that deck to work for these things to be enticing, right? I think, I think that you can make a good blue green deck. I, I, I have to, I have to look at the proper analysis of what makes the blue green tick, Mm -hmm. but I think I have a working idea about it and it's actually not as bad. It's, it's not as atrocious as, as, as green red was in uh, midnight hunt by far. It's, it's not, Mm. It's not that far off uh, the best deck in the format because this format is really close in terms of the power level of the color pairs. So you yeah, think I, I do the, agree with mm-hmm. that. The, 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 the spread from best deck to worst deck is, is not that big as far as win yeah, percent it's, goes. It's very small, actually. Yeah. Which we might touch later. Yeah, I, I feel like this format's way more balanced in terms of that. And you can, yeah. there's a lot of decks you can, you can be in. It's, it's not that like I won't draft blue, black or blue, green or whatever. I, I don't, that's not where I would start, but. I think that like trying to do something like force red green or red black or or prioritize it too highly is a lot riskier than it was in uh, Midnight Hunt. Yeah. Yeah, sure. ma- mainly because the reward is not that great. I mean, it's still a best deck, but it's not as best as uh, black um, uh, black red was in AFR, for example, where right. you just could close your eyes and force it, and you would definitely get a five three out of it. Right. Um, last common. I kind of better than everything else uh, so far is traveling minister. I'm in for, I like oh, that yes. better than the Epicure myself, but Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So that's nice. So but, we actually got a oh, decent one. You can still one. hope for wheeling it still. still wheeling it. it. Are you, you, what are you, a dreamer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a dreamer. I mean, it's just like people, like I know that lots of grinders are very high on it and rightfully so, but mm. the card still wheels. Oh man. I haven't wheeled one in a while, but I, I, 
I maybe for Christmas. Maybe that. The would only be my time Christmas these present. things wheel is when I'm not playing white. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, our Maybe uncommon? because you didn't pick them first, you know. Yeah. yeah well, then, then they wouldn't have wheeled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> first uh, uncommon is angelic quartermaster. That's a nice one. That's the three white white three three flying angel. And uh, when the ETBs, you put a plus one plus one counter on up to two other creatures. That's a very powerful card. That that is a really nice curve topper in a white deck. Yeah. The quartermaster is great. I think I would take it over the minister here. Um, do you agree with that, you guys, or do you like the low curve aspect better? Mm, no, I, I would pick the quartermaster. I think that the power level is just higher enough from the traveling minister to pick it, even though it's a five mana creature. Mm -hmm. And also, my personal experience is that my white aggressive decks usually lack a bit of reach at the in the in the end game, and then quartermaster provides exactly that, so it can. Put a counter on another flyer, and uh, and itself it pr provides a decent clock, so you can win the games like that. Yeah. Well, also you're wheeling traveling minister, so of course you wouldn't you, would, you wouldn't take the, the minister first. <laughs> Obviously, I mean people will pick kindly ancestor because because they love lifeling. So um, there yeah, you go. I forget I, the, tra the traveling minister also has lifeling. <laughs> I, yeah. I would take the 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 quartermaster as well. It's basically the same reason as Sirkovit said, like. It's, it's one of the best five drops for the white deck, which has trouble finding good high end, can finish things off. And it's just a really good tempo play on – if you curve out, play this on turn five, you often have a really nice attack on that turn. And then they're, you're, they're left to contend with a 3-3 three, three flyer. Yeah. Uh, next card really missed. It's Skulking Killer. This is a three and a black 4-2. And when ETB star creature, an opponent controls gets minus two, minus two until the turn, but only if it's the only creature that it, that they have. I hate this card. This is just such a disappointing yeah, card. It really is. And when it does work, you're happy, but I think your opponent probably is is, is fairly tilted. I, I am not a big fan of this design. Yeah, I think that most of the time you would need to set the board of your opponent by hand, maybe as a mind slaver or something to make it work. And uh, Because, okay, they have one creature on, on their side. Oh, it's a 3-3. Three, three. Oh, that does nothing. Yep. So basically... <laughs> The only way it works is that hey, they have exactly a two-two and nothing else, and 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 they miss the land drop, and you're winning anyway. Then, so totally, yeah, totally. not very happy about it. Just misses. Uh, and the last uncommon is panicked bystander. This is the one in a white two-two, and whenever it or another creature you control dies, you gain a life, and it's beginning your end step. If you gain three or more life this turn, it becomes a, what like a three-five. Oh yeah, Gary Oldman Invitational card. Um, I do, I do love that card, but I won't probably first pick it normally because this is exactly the card that I want to be seeing later to know that black white is open and then I can move into it. But, um, mm. uh, first picking it, 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 realistically you can, you can play it in other combinations, but it will be just so much better in the, uh, in the black white. So, um, yeah, good card, but not a first pick. Yeah. Agreed. I, I would take the minister over it and definitely the quartermaster over both. Do you agree with that, Luis? I do. I, I think it's a solid card, but it's not uh, not not something I'm taking over these other good white cards. Though I wouldn't be ha unhappy to take it fourth or fifth pick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is still a two mana two two that's a human with with pretty decent upside. Our rare is actually a mythic. Uh, kind of interesting. So if you want to be black white, you could take it, but it doesn't really fit into that deck well. It's Kaya Geist Hunter. This is the one black white three loyalty. And the plus one is creatures you control gain death touch until on the turn, and you can put a plus one plus one counter on uh, up to one creature token you control. And then the, the minus two is until end of turn. Um, if one or more tokens would be created under your control, twice that many tokens are created instead. And then the uh, ultimate, which is actually pretty good, is exile all cards from all graveyards. Then you get a one one white flying spirit creature token with flying for each card exiled this way. To me, that's the only interesting part about the card. I have played this a couple of times, but it really just ended up being a mini game of can I get to um, can I get to ultimate before you can kill Kaya? Yeah, I just don't think that this Planeswalker reliably does enough to be something that you should include in most decks. What do you think, Sirkovitz? Yeah, I, I, I think it's – I don't even know. I mean I, I wanted to say it's a constructed plan, but I don't even imagine the use of it in construct what you just – play the ultimatum and then Voring Clex with it and ultimate it on turn one or something. I, I, don't, I, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I just wouldn't, wouldn't pick it. Yep. I agree. So we're, we're all taking Angelic Quartermaster here at the end of the day. Is that? 
the end of the story. That seems like the plan. That's what I would do too. Not the best first pick. Yeah, not bad. Let's talk about the draft open real quick. Sirkovitz, you said you didn't have a chance to play in it. You had to skip it? And yeah, I planned something on Sunday. I had something planned on Sunday, and then I didn't want to play Saturday. And then, oh, if I win, I'm just going to be disappointed. And if I lose, I'm also going to be disappointed. So that was a bit of a mishap for me. By the way, Kaya has the second lowest win rate of all the rares and mythics in the format. So uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, wow. I knew it was bad, <laughs> only, but that's Only really demonic bad. bargain is worse. <laughs> only demonic <laughs> bargain. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, uh, so our inclination was right, but it was really right. My goodness sakes. Yeah, that's tough. Uh, were you bummed to miss it, you know, the, the first draft open? Yeah, I I did play quite a lot in the previous ones when there was possibility, and I was hoping to play this one, but then, yeah, I I, um, well, I couldn't play. I was a bit annoyed because, you know, I love playing those GP-style events. I yeah. think that this is a step in the right direction that we get the draft. I think that the next step would be to make day one sealed, day two draft. Who knows? Mm, so really kind of replicate that uh, that GP experience? Yeah, exactly. I mean, why do we love the limited uh, GPs? Because the first part of it is a sort of semi-random. I don't know. I feel just, like if, if I could go to a GP that was draft both days, I would rather do that. It's just yeah, cumbersome if, logistically, you know? If it was an input draft, then yeah. Yeah, sure, whatever. Just as long as I'm drafting. Um, yeah, draft is so much more fun. It is just more fun, That's you know. True. What about you, Luis? You got a chance to play in it, right? You, you. It was a little awkward with the timing. It, the draft open was the same weekend as the set championship. <laughs> that actually didn't bother me at all because uh -huh. um, there's there's downtime in between rounds of the set championship. That the so what I ended up doing was I streamed the draft open on day one of the draft open on Saturday, mm -hmm. which was day two of the set championship, and then when my set championship rounds had, uh, were on, I had to put a BRB screen because they wouldn't let us stream the set championship, which I still think oh. is just ridiculous. It's not like the, I mean I don't even know who they got to do coverage this time, but it couldn't be oh, that bad to have to have the hacks. option. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, like why not just give people the option of like, if you want, like not many people would have streamed it, but I don't know. Nassif might've streamed it. I would have streamed it. And you could have people watch that alongside our official coverage. If we got a feature match, sure. We got to turn off our stream and go to the feature match. That's fine too. You know, no, no, do none you know of us if there was a reason? Feels like yes. a free roll to them. The reason is they were worried. I mean, I'm extrapolating here, mm -hmm. but I believe the reason is they don't want the competition, which is a really, I think, hmm. poor way to think about things. But yeah, that's you know. interesting because you know normally they don't take that approach. Like they've let people co-stream, they they let other languages stream, like that are you know that are not on the main channel. So I'm a little surprised if if that is the reason. Well, I, maybe that's not, I guess, but I can't think of a good one. So that that one at least seems. Is like there a tournament possible. integrity thing? No, right. That's no. that's just you giving up. <laughs> like if I were to stream up. with no delay, that would just be really bad for me. I probably for I would you. put the delay on, you know. Yeah, of course. Okay, but, um, but so but that did mean that you had sh time though to to actually play so, the draft open on. So day yeah, one. so I, I streamed day one of the draft open and uh, went seven and two with a red black vampires deck, mm. uh, aided by a blood vial purveyor, mm -hmm. and then uh, day two of the draft open was kind of disappointing. I drafted a pretty mediocre red green werewolves deck. Just had no removal, no bombs. Um, oh, that's you know, tough. And you have to win and, eight best of threes to max right. out. Oh my god! Yeah, and I, I went. So I went three, three and two, and you know, okay. this was kind of a disappointing end. But I was really stoked that we got a draft open. I think that's really cool, and I and I would love to play more of them. Like yeah. I think that it's just so cool. So yeah. I, I'm definitely looking forward to to me getting another opportunity in the future to play those. Yeah, I played. I, I was in a similar position to what you were describing, Sirkovitz, where it was like. I didn't – so I was working, obviously. I was doing coverage for the set championship. And on day one, you know, you could um, you could play best – you know, it was best of one if you wanted. And that's what I played. And so I can easily get a game or two in on my downtime between rounds and still get prepped up for the next round and have no, no problem. Also, it went late, right? It, I think it went – they went pretty late into the night here. Um, and so what I did is I, I drafted a couple in the morning. Uh, I drafted one in the morning and it was a pretty bad deck, but I thought it might have the tools to get across the line and it didn't even come close. I think I went one and two or something like that. And I was like, okay, well, never mind. 
And so then in the afternoon, I decided, okay, well, I'll try to get ahead of it a little bit. So maybe I can just get the draft in, play a round or two. And then when I'm off work, I'll play the rest of them. And I did do that, except for then I lost again. Um, and I don't know, I, there's a chance that I was preoccupied with work or just um, not focusing well, because I felt like I wasn't playing that great either. Um, and then the decks just weren't really coming together. And I'm just like, okay, I just need to set this aside. Uh, cause you know, it is pretty expensive to enter uh, each time. I'm like, I'll just take a, a shot at it when I'm, when I'm off of work. And I ended up drafting, uh, when I got done with work, I fired up a draft and I ended up drafting a red blue deck with a hole breaker horror at the top and a bunch of like tempo, uh, elements in between. And, uh, and that deck really, I was able to really just sort of settle in and, and bang out a bunch of wins. And I, and I <clears> made my day two with that. But then I was in a really awkward position because, you know, it, for those of you that didn't play it, day two is best of three only. You do one draft at the beginning of the day and you have to win a whole bunch of rounds. Do you even redraft at any point, Luis? No, uh, I, I ended up just getting that on my first uh, attempt. No, I mean on day two. Do, do they? Do, I can't remember. Did they have people redraft at any oh, point? Oh, no. It's a lot no, of No, you rounds. only have one bullet. I, yeah. I, 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 well – I think a wish list for me for the future, if you're going to have that many rounds, is like if you get to four or five wins, maybe you get to draft again. Mm. Like that's you're making the second pod. Yeah. Like I think I think that could be a lot of fun because the way the way it currently was, not only I mean it's not just like hey you've got one deck you gotta you gotta get there with that deck if that deck's bad you know you're not gonna make it but you probably you might not make it anyway if your deck's bad right even whether right. even if it's like a threshold of four or five but it's more like it's kind of a lot to play that many rounds with the same deck. It really is. And so anyway, but I had to work and you know, this was the Sunday of the set championship. I have a lot of stuff going on for the booth. So I, and their best of three matches so they can actually go for a while. And if one of them starts to overlap with work, I just have to bail on it. So that doesn't feel good. And I can't push it off until I'm done with work and then jam a whole bunch of matches. Cause there's no way I could do you know, six, seven, eight matches if I ran it up or whatever in a couple hours. It's just just impossible. Yeah. So so I was like kind of just relegated myself to not really being able to play day two realistically. Um, but, you know, when I showed up, we had our, our little pre-show meeting, but then we have, you know, 45 minutes and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just draft my deck and maybe I'll play a couple rounds because, you know, there were gem payouts that, you know, were 5,000 or whatever gems or something. I thought, well, maybe I'll get lucky and I can run up a few gems, but I just won't be able to take like a real shot at this. But then I signed into the thing and I remember that it was a few minutes past eight and you have to sign up still this like weird torturous thing that they have where you have to sign up between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. And even though I was up, like I had to get up at about seven for work. If I could get rid of one thing into opens, it would be that. Yeah. If that was actually the one change I could make. It's never gotten me, but every single time there's an open, how many people on Twitter do you see complaining about this because they signed up a few minutes later, they forgot they had to do it or whatever, and it's just like it doesn't seem to be – like unlike the, the co-streaming, the PT thing, I don't even – can't even fathom an advantage for this. Yeah, I, did, I don't know why they do it that way. And you know, even me who wasn't planning on playing all of my rounds, I still felt like, geez, I don't even get to open – like I just get nothing because I was five minutes late or whatever. It's like, all right. And I mean, of course, if I had planned on actually like playing it and making a run, I would have been really disappointed. I mean, sure, it would have been on me, right? I, I knew. I just forgot, you know. But uh, yeah, so I didn't even get to draft a, a deck for day two, which was fine. Again, I, it probably was simpler that way anyway because I really did have a pretty full work day. The top eight ended up being pretty exciting. Lots of stuff going on, lots of storylines to follow and stuff. And uh, so I needed to kind of focus in on that anyway. But, uh, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to the next draft open and hoping that it doesn't coincide with, with one of the big tournaments. And, uh, maybe I can uh, mm. actually play my deck in, in day two if I get up, if I get up in time. <laughs> okay. I've got a bit of a rant to throw at you guys. I want you, I want your guys' take on this because I was, uh, reading some stuff on Twitter. I listened to constructed resources. I started getting kind of like, what the heck is going on here about this? So everybody, uh, listening, I'm curious uh, how much of our audience cares or, or has heard about alchemy, right? Which is the new set or, or format or whatever on arena where they're basically forking standard. So there's regular standard like you would have uh, in paper and on magic online that has the cards from the set that are legal and standard and you can play with them. 
And now there's a new set called or a new format called Alchemy that's arena only. And it has, it features two things that regular standard doesn't have. Otherwise it's the same. The two things are, it has cards that are specifically made for alchemy. And these are cards that are designed with a digital framework in mind, meaning that there are things that you can design for on digital only products that you can't in paper, right? It's that simple. And so they are giving themselves the design space to design cards around these and make them legal in this format. Okay. That, that kind of makes sense. They've dabbled in that already, but now we kind of have a, a, a format for it. The other thing that they're doing, and this is what I want to talk about is they're also giving themselves the ability to tweak cards after the fact. So they come out with a new standard release. It has a sweet card in it. And let's say it's Oko, right? Oko's like, you read it at first and you're like, oh, this is kind of neat. It makes food, whatever. And then you're like, wait, these are both pluses. And then you play it and you go, okay, this thing's stupid. Like what the hell? It ruins the format. They end up having to ban it. Now on Alchemy, they can just say, eh, we're going to make it cost four, or we're going to make the second ability a minus rather than a plus or a zero or whatever. And they can tweak these numbers to their heart's desire to make these cards act as intended to have the power level and impact and playability that they actually wanted it to have, but missed the mark on enough that they would either need to, to ban it or, or do something similar to that, depending on the format. And there is a whole discussion to have that's not really in the purview of this podcast, but like that BK and, and Luis talked about on Constructed Resources this week, just about how do we feel about that? What does that mean for paper cards? All of that kind of stuff. Fine. That That is actually a really interesting discussion. But from my perspective, I'm like, okay, Wizards, they're taking the gloves off with this, right? Now they can retroactively go back and switch cards around. When do we get this for limited? When, when do I get a set that is designed with cards that are of appropriate power level for limited only? And none of this nonsense where we get these cards that were clearly made to be constructed playable or for commander or whatever that have no business being around commons and uncommons of the average set, right? We, Luis, you and I have talked uh, about it recently uh, about Ben Stark having said, you know, hey, if I could just take rares and mythic rares out of all the sets and just draft with the commons and uncommons, he'd rather do that. And I think that there's a lot of people that have a similar sentiment. We didn't like that because I actually like some big splashy cards. I like some niche design space that you can't really spend on an uncommon that comes up too often to make it worth it. And I even like big powerful cards, but not uninteractive or so powerful that anything that either player did up until that point doesn't really matter anymore. Yet we still have to endure playing with these rares in these packs to bring this around. Traditional paper cards are constrained by the fact that they had to come in a booster pack. Now that started to get broken out a little bit with collector boosters and draft boosters, but still these aren't to benefit us. These aren't for limited players. We still have the same things that we've always had, which is there's cards in our booster packs that we're drafting with that were not designed for the set that we're drafting for the power level of the other cards in the set, uh, or even mechanically, they're just oddballs that just don't have a home right? Uh, you know, good example is our rare today, Kaya, right? It's all about tokens. Well, there's only a few cards that really make tokens in this set. So that card's just a rip up. It's not interesting. And as Sirkovit said, it's one of the worst cards in the set. That could be a really interesting black, white planeswalker that cared about life gain or something for the black, white life gain deck for us limited players. But instead they wanted a token maker for, you know, whatever format, uh, Kaya ends up seeing play in it if she does it all. That was the constraint, the booster pack, because they needed to put everything for everybody into those on arena booster packs aren't even a thing they're they're a medium of prize they don't they don't you don't draft actual boosters that has nothing to do with anything so why not just take the shackles off and say here's your limited set when you open up your booster pack you get to keep all the cards like normal of all the cards that you select and if you take this card you'll get the full standard version of it over here but for limited, here's its stats. And you can just read it right on the screen. And if you're a limited only player, you would just think that that's what that card did and not even care about it for constructed at all. Why can't we have that uh, for, for limited? 
That's a great point. I mean, the the combination of two things, which you've identified, which is booster packs don't really mean anything with set boosters, collector boosters, draft boosters, who knows, and the clear you know ability and inclination to to have digital only designs and change cards online. Yeah, why 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 shouldn't you know? After all, why shouldn't we change draft yeah, cards exactly. to be better? The classic Luis line, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's true though. Like it. If you could design a draft set and constructed didn't exist and packs didn't exist, like you didn't have to worry about packs, what would you do? And the answer is not nothing. So given that the answer is something and is going to be different in some way, why not give us the opportunity to find what that way is? Yeah, I like it, Marshall. What do you think, Sirkovitz? Do you think that there's design space for us to to have um, not only sets that are designed just for limited, but also even just the functionality that we've seen, which is the ability to go back and say, oh, this card is overperforming relative to how we would hope it would be for a limited set. We're going to go ahead and make a change to it, but just for limited. So, okay, I, I have to start with a very selfish approach to that. Mm-hmm. And for me, it would be a nightmare because imagine <laughs> I do my two weeks analysis of the data of limited and after two weeks, they change a couple of cards. And then five days later, they change one more card. Now I have three data sets of uh, varying quality. Then they decide, oh, let's put in one extra tweak gone. I can't really analyze that data because uh, it changes too <laughs> rapidly and, and it creates great pain in, in, in my in my it hobby. It does make well, your work awesome. life difficult, but it also gives you a lot oh, to... Yeah, cla- it, classic it, it, it means that you're needed, right? Data. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, us paper boomers are just are just try, are, are on the side of uh, anti-data. <laughs> uh, but apart from that, uh, I mean, and we talked about it in the pre-show and that happened before because... Um, in the early days of Arena, in the olden days when there were still them bots, um, mm-hmm. they did change bots occasionally, and that always ended up with a complete reevaluation of the format. Like, and interestingly, some some formats they stayed as the first bot version in some people's memory, like uh, Eldrain, when people remember um, the menace of uh, Merfolk Secret Keeper that uh, got. Uh, changed by the bots, uh, I think after three weeks and you couldn't draft it for the love of it. Uh, and then yeah. the red became a madness, but everyone remembers the secret keeper because most people play in the early uh, format. So, okay, that we, we survived that. And I guess that if those changes would be scheduled, so let's say like after three weeks of the format, we do first round of changes after six weeks, we do the second round and then we got a new set. That would be acceptable. I'm just worried that you know, you can you can create more problems by 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 making some changes than um, than generating uh, value. So first of the thing, bombs are annoying and you lose to them occasionally. But uh, there's a good reason why higher rarity cards are a bit more powerful, and bombs are just a symptom of it. If you sort of make the bombs or make the rares flat level power for limited. You end up in the Ben Stark's dream world where basically everything is a common and then opening something does not bring this kind of joy that you can build around something. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. I mean, I get it that if you open a, a constructed plant rare that is not playable, it's it's annoying and maybe that can be somehow balanced out. Um, what I'm worried about is when they start playing with commons by by, by reducing their power level and, and, and reshuffle um, the formats too much because... Uh, there is some charm in, in, in enforcing one deck, as Lewis will agree, uh, with his uh, blue-black uh, marathon uh, <laughs> in in the Midnight Hunt. Um, because, you know, you gain advantage in limited by basic two factors. Ability to draft well, because you know what's going on in the format, and ability to play well. There are people that are good in both aspects of the game, like Luis, and there are people like me that are only good in one aspect of it, which means drafting relatively well and then trying not to ruin it as much as possible in the <laughs> gameplay. So for players like me, leveling up the common levels is a true recipe for a disaster because it more and more depends on the gameplay. So it mm. really depends on what uh, do wizards want to make limited, a skill format of being able to draft or a skill format being able to play. They already have a bunch of formats that are purely play based dependent and, you know, like making a deck, but that's also counts. But uh, as Lewis proves one uh, uh, time after time, you don't need to build a deck to uh, to do well on the Pro Tour. <laughs> you just need to get the right deck from your mates and then twitch it a bit here and there and uh, 
and that's enough because you know the play skill is so uh, predominant. But um, yeah, if you want to make limited more like constructed, please uh, by all means uh, rebalance the card, make all the colors even. Uh, but you lose a bit of a charm of limited because of that, I think. Okay. Or at least you run into that risk. Although I would definitely want them to try doing that, and I would be super happy to see them try and and see how it works. I think it's in general a good idea. I, I just want to pinpoint as the devil's advocate that there might be a couple of problems with it. Yeah, I mean, because I think I mean, that these the, guys know it. I mean, they 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 know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, I, and I you know because I think that what happens is is that you kind of go down this road that kind of breadcrumbs, right? Where you're like, oh well, you know, if if constructed cards are being tweaked after the fact. Why not limit it? And then you're like, okay, so like maybe there's a couple of rares that we would change a few things on just to, again, you don't want to make them equal to the uncommons, but you don't want to have them be um, so powerful that they kind of ruin a game, right? That when they hit, it's just like, it's over. There's a bunch of rares in each set that hit a really nice balance where it's like, dang, that's a good card. Like I got to get a move on here. That's going to give my opponent an advantage. I have to react to that, you know, but there's a few of them that don't give you a window to really do anything. And then the game's just over. And it's like, okay, th that I think most people agree, even the people who win with them, because I often hear the argument that, well, bad players need them so that they can beat the good players sometimes. But I'm like, yeah, but the, when the good players beat the bad players with that, then they just feel even worse. It's just, I don't know. I think, I don't think that it really adds, I don't think that it really serves that role particularly well. But at any rate, you know, so you start going down the road of, okay, uh, we're going to go back and tweak numbers on rares to make them better cards, you know, to, to kind of do it. But I think if you follow that to its natural conclusion, you just sort of wake up and say like, well, these aren't attached to any booster packs at all. So why don't we just build the entire limited set? separately like mm. but why is this attached to anything having to do with constructed at all the thing that i do like about it is the collection building aspect i like the fact that you can draft and then get the cards that you need to play constructed so that's why i was suggesting okay there's a rare in this slot and the limited version is is not the same thing as the constructed version but when you pick it for your deck you know, you're going to play the limited version in draft, but you now have a copy of the constructed version outside of it or whatever. So you don't so, lose uh, that with, overlap. Yeah. So with, with this, I have one, one, one fear in this capacity of wizards to play test the set uh, for, well, basically creating three separate sets at the same time when, uh, when they normally do one. I mean, how much time can they dedicate to testing <laughs> limited to make a perfect limited format? And at the same time, testing a slightly different set for standard and, uh, I think yeah. it's time that they face the fact that these are different products and put two different teams on it. Like, I don't but know why the <clears throat> te same team has to figure out every single thing about Oko and also has to figure out, you know, that the uncommon rare or the uncommon gold card for, you know, whatever archetype and limited is balanced correctly. Like, I would just say, well, let, hey, first of all, let's not use the team that figured out. Okay, let's 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 use a different team. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair, fair. But you know what I mean? Like, like honestly, it it almost it almost goes to my point, right? Because maybe you know, if you're spreading people across those two things, that's why we have misses like that sometimes. Because they're like, well, we had to get draft right, and you know, I mean, I honestly don't know exactly how the teams are broken down, so I I may just be off with this anyway, but. I guess my point is, is, you know, maybe we should hold them to a standard of saying, let go of this idea, you know, that these things are the same and let's get a team that's fully dedicated to just doing limited on the limited part of the set. Okay. So which cards would you rebalance in the, in this current set? Oh, this is a good question. So the ones that jump to mind straight away, uh, are Troxel. Yeah. Right. And again, I'm, by, uh, Man, by I, I, I don't have a good feeling about this. If you, if if your answer is just let's let's take the top five cards and make them all worse, I'm not that that makes that's not how I would. No, but approach. no, no, no. That is I, not I, my I'm, answer. I'm set, that, that he asked me where I would start, <laughs> and that's where I would start. <laughs> what, 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 what do you what do you think, Luis? Because that would absolutely be the first thing I would do. Oh, I would actually also change Troxel because I think that card is, is nonsense. But uh, well, I would take I would change Averbrook Caretaker. I would change Henrika Domnathi. I would change Cemetery Desecrator. These are the top four. I would change all of these. So that would be the first thing that I would do. It wouldn't be the only thing I would do though. Oh, I so would just, probably not change most of those. I would just I, I would I would I would look at why more than like oh, why 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 why. Well, first of all, I don't think 
Desecrator or Henrika Domnathi are nearly in the same ballpark as Toxrel and the Caretaker in terms of the play experience. It's okay having cards that are really good, even cards that are hard to beat. Mm-hmm. But Toxrel is like, kill all your stuff, make a bunch of slugs. What's the counterplay there? It's not particularly interesting. The right. other ones, I think, have some interesting counterplay. Okay. Caretaker, I don't, I don't love because it doesn't, it, right? It's it's X-proof. It doesn't really give you that many options. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> I don't mind there being like I've said this many times. I don't mind there being powerful cards that win games. I, ideally, they are something that you, makes you feel like there is still a game to be had. And that's that's where the line is for me too. Yeah. So I, I'm right there in line with you. Like, sure, maybe like here's what would really happen. I would want to tweak uh, tweak Henrika just a little bit, but I wouldn't because it's not worth changing it. It's because that card is still interactable and and like you said, it's powerful. But fine, that's fine with me. Desecrator, I actually might because it's just so stupid and annoying, but whatever. Like, I wouldn't tweak Soren. I wouldn't tweak Faithbound Judge or Maniform Hellkite, any of those things. So I'm with you on that. The question is, what do you do after that, right? Like, wh- where where do you take this? Let's say from an archetype perspective, we're in the, we're, we're three weeks into to Midnight Hunt and we get some numbers back and it says that the werewolves are – drastically underperforming we watch it for another two weeks and nothing changes do you start tweaking the format right like little things across the board for those you know do you nerf defenestrate like do you start like getting in there or are you giving up something because of the you're you're giving up the replayability and you're sort of shaking the foundation so that people show up and go what happened like i don't even know what's going on with this set anymore i feel like i have to read every card every time like there has to be a line a complexity line where you don't want to cross that right yeah so the, the 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 most appealing part of this for me isn't like hey let's rebalance some some of the most powerful cards because some of those are because of constructed, some are not, right? Mm-hmm. Tox rolls. I don't think a card that's made the way it was because it, it's particularly appealing for constructed. As far I as I know, it's, it's really a commander thing, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think and that, that's, that's, that's why it says blue, no, in 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 the activity ability. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but what I really like is what you just mentioned, which is, hey, Midnight Hunt's been out for three weeks, and Red Green wins seven percent less than the next archetype. What can we do about that? Like, oh, let's. Uh, you know, let's let's go ahead and, and and tweak some of the werewolves and make them a little stronger. Let's make Silver Bolt cost four to activate. Let's mm-hmm. you know change like a smattering of cards. And honestly, like from my experience in live balancing games, whether that's uh, Eternal Storybook Brawl, like little numbers tweaks go like way further than you think. Like you know, Sirkovitz had it nailed when if you change one of these cards like to instead of, a, you know, you make Kindly Ancestor a 2-2 two, two instead of a 2-3, the win rate on that card is going to change drastically. Interesting. It's really, like, because re- you don't have very, like, when, when magic cards, they're not, they're not very granular. How many numbers are on a magic card? There's the casting cost, and if it's a creature, power and toughness, and there's the text box. You don't have a whole lot of ways to change that. Every change you make is pretty massive. Mm. You make Flourishing Hunter into a 5-6. I mean, that's obviously less of a relative change than 2-3 two, to 2-2. Two, two. Still a really big change. And my experience is that you will change some of these cards slightly and you'll see a pretty big impact on the end. So I bet if you gave me five number changes, I could make Red Green Werewolves a lot more enticing to draft in that in Midnight Hunt than it was beforehand. Sirkovitz, would you want to see these type of changes rolled out piecemeal where it was like, Oh, you know, Tuesday we change this. And then the next Wednesday we tweak this. And, or would you want to have it be like, all right, we're at the halfway point of the format and we're going to make the patch, right? It's the big patch yeah, no, for, I'm, for I'm, mid I'm, and then I'm, it all comes I'm, out at once. So first of all, from practicality, it's like, you know, when you play limited, you'd spend a lot of time practicing the format. If the format is shifting daily, it's just impossible to, appropriately draft yeah. appropriately to find build a your home. deck and appropriately. Yeah. yeah exactly it's just like okay yesterday this was good but today i don't even know what's going on because they they, they changed some things and uh, and maybe the decks that i was or the card that i was used to i have to rediscover them again and it takes a couple of replications to, to figure out where the cards have their homes and uh, how to play them so i would definitely if if that's some, something like that would happen i would definitely go for like set dates when those things happen so people can get ready. I mean, it obviously would make the data analysis part easier because I know the cutoff point and then reanalyze that. Just one point to the to the cards that you wanted to change. I I, I did ask that because um, because of obviously I had something in mind. Mm-hmm. But um, 
You said Toxril, that's the seventh uh, best win rate among the rares and mythic rares, and Averbrook uh, Caretaker, which is 15th in terms of win rate in um, uh, in, in rares and, and, and mythic rares. So I know that those cards are oppressive, but they are balanced in a way. And, and there's several ways how they're balanced. Like, first of all, the mana cost uh, of seven is, um, you know, you will remember those games when you lose to those cards, but it's the same as looking at the win rate when cast. Well, basically, some cards have a very high win rate when they are cast, but in so many games, they're just not cast because there's no time. And, you know, especially uh, where you, caretaker. Uh, which, I don't want to interrupt, but I know where you're getting your numbers. <laughs> but what are you talking Like, Troxel has 67.4 games in hand win rate. Games, on- in, games in hand, but I'm talking about decks that do have uh, Toxel. Because, you know, when you draw it, Yes, you, you, it means you went to a long game already uh, because you are more likely to draw it in a long game. Uh, so there is a slight bias in there. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the games, uh, at the win rate when the card is in a deck. They are not so oppressive because uh, they are not in the best uh, archetypes because people, when they draft those cards, usually put on the blinders very early when they picked it early and uh, draft a substandard deck because they tried to fit in Toxrel in their deck. So there is slight... Uh, ways of balancing those type of cards and it's partially hanging from the mentality of the people and partially men- uh, the the high casting cost of them is uh, oppressive. Averbrook Caretaker is a great card, don't get me wrong, but if you're way behind, it does basically nothing. When you play it on the empty board and it's day, then what? You just play the 4-4. It's got Hexproof, which is slightly annoying, but it won't bring you back in that game. So, yeah, I need to go back. So w- what number are you using for this? Oh, no, these are, the, these are the numbers that I uh, actually do calculate myself from, uh, from, the, um, uh, from the data. But I you're saying we shouldn't show. use game and hand win rate for this? Um, to look at the – look, I mean, <coughs> yes, game and hand win rate will, uh, uh, will be skewed to the games that lasted long which will slightly improve those bombs that are heavy top end. But won't it appropriately punish the bombs that cost seven mana if you've drawn it and the game doesn't go long? Yeah, but you will draw them more often in the games that last longer because you have yeah. card draw, because you build the deck around it. So uh, so basically, yeah. you're much more likely to draw it in the game that is lasting longer than in the game that is you just lost on turn five. Because in game that But that's lasted, true of any the, card, right? I, like, yes, it is. But uh, these cards have a disproportionately uh, higher win rate when you actually cast them. So it's, you know, it's a bit of the same trap as looking at the win rate as cast that we discussed in the first um, uh, uh, show that I was yeah, invited for. I, I just, I thought, I, in my mind, the games in hand filters for that. Yes and no. So the problem is that the... The, the the length distribution of the games when you draw something and the ga- the length distribution of the games when you don't draw something is not exactly the same. So we're comparing slightly different samples there. Okay. Because, I mean, I'm looking and Troxel the Corrosive has the number one games in hand win rate of all cards in the whole set and Caretaker's number five with, you know, it's it's only a percent and a half below it. But all of those cards, you know, in between are, are incredible. Yeah, yeah. No, that, 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 that's definitely the case. Okay. Um, um, Luis, going back to the idea of when and how changes like for this type of thing might be done, would it renew your interest in a format if you knew that halfway through there was going to be a rebalance, um, you know, a, attempting to, to tweak or change some things that, you know, maybe it was right to the point where it was starting to get a little stale for you or you were kind of like, oh, I wonder if Cube's up or whatever. But you know that in, in three days they're doing the big Midnight Hunt rebalance and you can jump back in and kind of rediscover the format anew. Would that be enticing to you from a like how many times you draft a format perspective? Definitely. If, again, if I were to give the have the power to structure this, I think the idea of like one big patch in the middle is better than like small changes for the same reason that Sirkovic said, which is like, it's all sense of permanence. You don't want people who don't play as often to, to feel like they don't really know what's going on. And the sand's always shifting. That said, we're uh, all three of us are among the like t- tippity top in terms of investment for limited players and draft and probably number of drafts as well. So yeah, this is all going to sound great to us, but I do think it actually would be interesting to see if you, if you didn't have to worry about paper at all. Yeah. Rebalancing Midnight Hunt halfway through the format and changing 
50 things or, or 25 things or something I think could just be awesome. It's kind of like not free because you had to do the design work and the work to change it, but it's very low cost content because mm-hmm. you're almost introducing like a new draft format Yeah, and at way less than the cost of making a new draft format. Right. Because the thing that I keep coming to is where does the line get drawn? So for example, one question that I had while thinking this through was, okay, if we're going to tweak cards, can we ban them? Right. Can we just say, yeah, we're just just not, you know, right. But now you start to go down the road of, well, if we're going to ban cards from limited, aren't there types of cards that we may just want to not have in limited from the get go? Right. And now we're kind of down this road on, let's just design this thing for limited from the ground up and not really care about, you know, uh, constructed basically. Right. Cause like if, you know, as a game designer, Luis, if, if I said, okay, you're in charge of designing a new set, Right. And here's your constraints. And I gave you the constraints of a typical magic set. You know, you need to fit in a bunch of things for a bunch of different crowds, as we've talked about. If I came to you and said, no, 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 that that's over now. I want you to design this set specifically for limited only. Right. And so, you know, like you would never have Kaya in this set if you were designing for limited only, for example. Right. You you may have a three mana black, white planeswalker and but you would make her fit into one of the archetypes so that, you know, she could accentuate like life gain or whatever it is, you know, that that particular color pair was going for. You would end up with quite a different set, you know, than what they come up with now. Yeah. And and to be clear, it's not like I would make these cards all better or more powerful, but Kaya is just not a u- usable card right now. Right. If you were making for limited, like you probably wouldn't have that card in there. At least you'd make it. So it plays with the themes of that, of that set. Yeah. Right. And so that could also improve the set overall, just if all the cards in there were relevant on some level, even if, you know, you, you're still going to figure out what's playable and not. Uh, okay. So, so I have a, again, devil's advocate question. Yeah. You think that clear the mind was a card that was good for limited? Yes. Uh, wh- like- which one was that? That we shuffle sh- all your graveyard and uh, draw a card, but would oh you think yeah, that that ended up for you? that ended up being a, a thing. Yeah, that was cool. But I think that that might be one of the things that would be trimmed if you would make a limited only uh, mm-hmm. set, and that would basically annihilate the whole archetype. That would be trimmed by uh, a limited design team that didn't understand limited, like that you need occasional like look. I'm not in the Ben Stark camp of like compressing everything down to like playable commons and uncommons. I still like outliers. I still like weird cards, but some of them are so outlier or so weird that like they just don't fit at all. But some of my favorite limited cards over time are cards like that, that you have to kind of wait and discover later. And I think that, you know, a good design team would say, we'll take a shot on this. It's probably not going to see much play, but if people figure it out or if it does actually fit in, then then we can make it work. But that's a good point though, Sirkovitz. It is that it could lead you down a road of thinking too narrowly and missing out on some of the cool kind of corner case opportunities. All right. Well, thanks for your thoughts on that, guys. I, I got that off my chest. I feel a lot better. But one of the impetus for this whole discussion, right, of course, are the bombs, right? Sometimes the bombs, when they're non-interactable, or can feel like, they don't uh, let you come back into the game or that whatever you did before didn't matter. That's not a good feeling. And a lot of people have been having that feeling about this set. (laughs) And, uh, you know, we've said it, it's been talked about uh, on Twitter, infinite people have written articles about it, about that this set is particularly bomb heavy. And Sirkovitz, I want to ask you as somebody who, who knows the data, is that true? Is, is Val bombier than what we've seen recently? All right. This is a very, very, very difficult question Uh, for for several reasons. It's a very difficult question because what what is a bomb? We we don't have a definition of a bomb. We have a feeling of what is a bomb. Yes. I mean, I guess that we can say um, a card that uh, increases your win rate by a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there are several factors that influence that. And um, one big factor that does influence it in, in this particular set is um, this set is flat and power in terms of color pairs. Uh, and this is something that um, when we talk about uh, what is a bomb and what is not a bomb, uh, you should uh, you should be thinking about. So just uh, looking at my numbers, we basically have the, in terms of color power rankings for two color decks, because that's the easier way to analyze it. We have Rakdos as the number one, 
56.6%. Then at number six, we have Orzo, 55%. There is 1.6 percentage points difference between uh, the best archetype and the sixth archetype, which mm. is quite... Um, which is quite quite far away from each other, but really close in terms of the win rate. At the same time, if you look at the mid, you had the first one was Azorius 59.2, and the sixth one was Boros at 55.4, so almost uh, four percentage points difference. So that's like twice as big, oh no, more than twice as big as a gap uh, between the best and the sixth archetype uh, in those uh, two formats. So <clears throat> when we look at the bombs, it's something that vastly increases the win rate of a deck. So obviously, since you told me that you want to talk about the bombs, I I, <laughs> I did this analysis where I uh, basically looked at um, best rares and mythics, and um, to sort of measure the bombiness, I looked at uh, what is the win rate, uh, not trophy rate, of the decks that contain a particular card. Okay. So the best thing that uh, I got was Volatile Arsonist, the 5-mana 4-4 four, four haste werewolf. The irony, the biggest bomb being a werewolf in the vampire deck <laughs> is not lost on me. Um, but this one has like 20.5% trophy rate. So basically 20.5% of the decks that contained a copy of that card trophied. So it went 7x. Wow. That sounds quite impressive, no? It does. Until you think that uh, Blue Black in Midnight Hunt had an average trophy rate of 20.5%. Just that color pair full stop? Independently of what card was in it, oh, independently. Oh, oh, oh. Did you factor in how many times I drafted Blue Black? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He I actually did. did. I did. <laughs> probably, 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 no. Not, not, not numerically because we randomized the data, so I cannot know who played it, but um, I can guess that um, that played as a factor into it. But, you know, and we're talking about the most drafted archetype as well. It was not like, oh, wow. there was something niche that uh, only Lewis figured out. No, everyone figured out that Blue Black was good. And um, uh, and still it had 20.5% win uh, trophy rate. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, when we think about what is a bomb, maybe it would be worth looking at it from the perspective of the format. This format has bombs but it's balanced by the fact that the archetypes are more or less even in terms of their win rates. Uh, and this neutralizes the bombs because it's not that, uh, you know, probably the biggest bombs in, uh, in, the, in the previous format were the ones that were in the best archetypes because if you had already a super strong archetype and on top of that you had Denik, which was a very high um, uh, trophy rate card in that format, uh, your already amazing deck that should beat everything else became even better because you get this uh, really good card. Maybe it mm -hmm. was not as oppressive as uh, Toxrel is, but then if Toxrel is put into the archetype that wins roughly 50% of the games, you will sometimes win with it, but uh, you don't have a guarantee of doing that, um, and you will not always draw it, so it will not become like this oppressive force. I think that you know if, if Toxrel was on top of the... Uh, Blue Black deck and Midnight Hunt. Now that would be oppressive, and then we would talk truly about the um, uh, bomb-driven format because you have this oppressive archetypes that already put better players into the particular path, and they can abuse it well. And on top of that, if they got the bombs, then it just becomes like um, it just becomes unfair. Mm -hmm. can, and, can, um, can you compare the archetype? I don't know if there's enough data, but is it possible to compare the archetype as a without a card, but and then? To the versions that had the card in it. Oh, um, uh, hmm, you know, like if, if blue, like you know, if, if blue if, black if, is if twenty. If only I had exactly that data. Uh, no. uh, <laughs> that I step on. It, Sorry, it's not. Ex it's not exactly what you asked for. But uh, what I did is I looked at the. Um, I sort of tried to look at the breadth of the bombs and the um, um, and the. Um, archetypes uh, that do contain them. So basically I looked at the top 20 win rate rares and mythic rares and, and, and the trophy rates. And then I basically looked at the uh, decks that contain zero copies of those bombs, uh, one copy, two copies, three copies, four copies of the bombs uh, in them. And I looked at the how, the, how does the trophy rate change over uh, the more card I include in the analysis basically. So yeah, I, I told you already that the, the best one was the um, uh, Arsonist, and that had 20.5% uh, uh, trophy rate. Mm -hmm. And the decks that don't contain it, so everything else, it's uh, uh, around 13.5% win rate. 
And then basically, uh, as you expand the selection by the card, so I think that the second most uh, winning uh, uh, mythic rare is uh, wedding anniversary. Then we have Henrika, Anje, Katilda, Halana, and um, Alena, Toxrill, Dreadfist, Dreadfist Demon, Stensia Uprising, and, and so on. So I expanded with everything. When I look at the top 10 rares and mythics, um, top 10, let me take a quick look. Um, then that trophy rate goes down to 18%, because of course I added cards that are not as successful as the um, uh, mm-hmm. Voldar, and, uh, Voldar Arsonist, whatever. Uh, and the decks that don't contain those cards have around 12% trophy rate. So this also drops because of course I remove all the decks with the bombiest cards from the ones that contain zero. Right. And it sort of drops down to like, when I look at even 40 top rares, we still get a 10% uh, trophy rate for the decks that don't have any of the top 40 rares and mythics, and um, and 13% trophy rate for the decks that have at least, well, well that, that have exactly one of, of those 40 top rares. Okay. And then if you have two copies, it goes up to 17%. If you have three copies, it goes to 21% of those uh, super good rares, basically. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you, you see the impact of them, obviously, but um, it's not like atrocious. I'm pretty sure that this format is more, the, the rares are more powerful uh, at what they do, but they are balanced by several factors. And I already told you, like one one is the cost, uh, the other is the human psychology. When people open a bomb, they will be probably more likely to stick to it for the love of it. And in this format, probably that's not always a good idea, mm-hmm. but hey, I mean, if I open, I open Necro Duality. I, I I did force it, and 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 uh, because I, I I wanted to try to play it. I think it's a powerful card, and uh, uh, I want to see how it operates. So I'm just going to stick to it if I open it. I mean, it's not that I'm going to open it in every draft that I'm playing here. Uh, and the, another thing is, uh, yeah, the the balance of colors is is sort of neutralizing some of those bombs because uh, you don't have that one super dominant archetype, like you know. Ragdos is good here, but it's not like busted good. It's it's much uh, lower win rate than um, uh, than the top archetypes in any of the previous four sets, I think. And so, so is there a way to com- like? Do you have a sense for comparing them from one set to the next? That what that's what makes it difficult because right. um, they're not apples to apples at I, all, it's, right? It's really hard to yeah. It's it's really hard to uh, to get the effect of the bomb when you have diametrically different distributions of uh, win rates of particular archetypes. Right, of course. And, you know, it might be that you measure the power of the bomb, or it might be that you power uh, measure the power of an archetype. Like, for example, like I'm, I'm sure that Anya is a very good card, but I'm pretty sure that the part of its win rate is, um, uh, is uh, confounded by the fact that it will be almost always in the black-red deck, which is the best, highest win rate. And in sets where... Uh, the disproportions between different archetypes are even bigger, this difference will become appropriately bigger. So you will measure, that, oh, that card is super bomby, but actually it's been carried on the back of uh, good commons and uncommons in the in, in the particular archetype. So it's pretty difficult. I try to analyze it, but um, boy, there's so many confounding factors in there. And uh, um, now that I started doing it, I can promise you that the next couple of sets, I can look at it in a more, much more stringent way because I have a good analysis start uh, uh, using this format. But now I would have to go like three, four, three formats back and, and, and see what was a bomb there, uh, which uh, it, those analyses are surprisingly time consuming. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so basically, you feel though that at this point you've you've created a bit of a baseline, and you can start to kind yeah. of answer these questions going forward a little bit better. So maybe we'll be able to look back one day and uh, and figure it out. Oh, but uh, but definitely one thing that um, uh, shows from this set is that this set is way more balanced than you would think in terms <laughs> of like those don't make don't make a massive difference in terms of. Uh, uh, win rates of the decks they are in because it's so important to be in the right color combination, I think. And you can't force decks. You, it's, it's definitely the uh, drafting the hard way format. And I think that this is its saving grace because if you can force an archetype and you open a bomb, that's a different story than if you open a bomb and you're not sure if you're going to end up in the right uh, combination of cards to 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 play the, the uh, to play the archetype. And in this 
there is never a guarantee of what's going to happen. You know, you can yeah. pick a red bomb and then don't see good red cards ever in the draft. Or even worse, see middling red cards and pick them because you want to play your bomb and end up with a middling deck with one bomb that you draw 40% of the time. Um, is it possible? I mean, I know, I know the, the answer, I guess, but I guess I'm just sort of rhetorically saying that a format could feel bombier than it actually plays out. I think it is. And I think that this is the case with this format. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to pretend that, um, uh, Averbrook caretaker is not a bomb and that the fact that you are, um, you can't deal with it, basically, when it hits the board. It's super annoying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the same thing can be said about Halana and Alena when you're just like, oh, I, I, I kept the hand without removal. They played on turn four, goodbye life, uh, right. basically. Right, um, yeah. it, it, yeah. it feels very bad. And, and the feeling is um, it has a face, or in case of Halana and Alena, two faces, uh, <laughs> which, which is not something that you had as a feeling when you were paired against a, a black-red... Um, in AFR, there was I nothing mean, to point we your were hatred still complaining at. Complaining about it, but yeah. there's nothing you can pin it on, you know. Yeah, like yeah. price of loyalty was the ideal card to pin your anger on, but in the end, you just okay, I lost with the black red mill. That I guess that happens, and you don't feel as bad about it as you would feel. And guess what? They just play Ava Brook caretaker. And then the game ended. Yeah, well, that's great stuff, Sirkovitz. Uh, thanks for looking into that for us. Um, it's really interesting topic, and it's one that we'll continue to to revisit as well. Uh, the idea that if a format is well balanced, it may not matter as much. You know, we gave a lot of A's out in the set review and we would stand behind many of those and maybe even more than we normally would. But maybe that just kind of balances things out a bit. Great discussion today, guys. Uh, I, really I do have one more words. thing. Oh, on, go for it, Luis. On bombs. And this isn't uh, – this would be – this has some judgment attached. When I did my uh, deep dive on Sealed, I found that like – of the 84 rares and mythics, I thought like 22 of them you had to, in, in Crimson Vow, basically like you couldn't justify not trying to put them in your deck. You wouldn't always get to, but these are 20, like my, about a quarter of the cards, actually slightly slightly more, were by Must my play. estimation like uh, A-level a bombs. And in Midnight Hunt, it's like 17. So that's not, again, like what – why do I think this card is and this card isn't? I couldn't exactly tell you what that. I'm not looking. I'm not filtering by win rates. You could maybe do that. That would be a different thing. But my like surface level, like how many cards if I open in a pack do I think are like A's? I think that does that does matter to some degree. Like that 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 density does play play towards this. Even if there's a lot of different ways to kind of analyze this and try to get down to what is a bomb heavy format and what impact exactly do they have? I think that this plays towards people's perceptions if all if more of the rares are quote good rares okay that that is that is that is definitely true and you uh, know actually i i did uh did do analysis looking at exactly the 22 cards that you mentioned i think it was 21 actually but um uh, let's not split hairs there um because i thought okay i i normally don't have a good definition of a bomb so i'll just stick with the lsv definition of a bomb and uh, yes, definitely. When you put when you have more copies of those cards that you mentioned specifically, you got um, higher win rates, um, and that increased with the number. So yeah, I mean clearly those cards are uh, Im Im impacting the deck. But they also like having multiple copies says something about openness of the draft. But the um, one thing that um, you should look at is that lots of those bombs they have a very specific home in this uh, in this format like you know Catilda is a bomb but it's not a bomb in every single deck it, it just really gets particular requirements uh, mm -hmm. and um, and this is another thing that uh, this format has uh, that is slightly different from um, um, from the previous ones and I think that here I was super high on the traveling minister before the set was released not because I think that it's a powerful card uh, although that also pay, plays a role but I thought that it's one of the few commons that fits in every single archetype in every mm -hmm. single color combination. Because I looked at this spoiler and said, like, oh my God, so many of those cards are super situational. And, uh, you know, I'm drafting green and normally I have 23 commons available, but now I'm in green red and I have 12 commons available. And that is a completely different story from, uh, from the previous sets where most commons were fitting in multiple archetypes. Right, that makes sense.
Yeah, this is this is really good stuff. I, I love that we can actually start to hone in on answers to these things. But uh, at any rate, we got to call it a show there. Um, Sirik Vitz, I want to say thanks for coming on again. I always look forward to your, your episodes and the insight that you bring. Mm, thank you very much for having me again. Where can I people mean, find I'm, you? I'm surprised that you still tolerate me. But oh uh, no, 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 no. Just, just to to be clear, every episode, if it's good enough, we have you again. So you, you gotta you gotta earn your spot. <laughs> okay, at the yeah, table. No, 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 of course. <laughs> but you did you did though. This was good. This was good. You got yeah, one more. Yeah, you you cleared the bar. Uh, where can people find you <laughs> if they wanna if they wanna um, uh, find you on social media or wherever you're you're doing stuff in magic? Yeah, so first things I would like to, as always, thank to the 17 Nun guys that um, do all the work while I milk the credit by appearing here. Um, uh, so, yeah, if, if you can give them some love and support the Patronite and, uh, you know, use it, even using it is quite useful for, for getting more data for me, at least, uh, then please do so. I do stream on occasions. Uh, well, normally today I do uh, seminars every week and I do stream some of my drafts, which arguably are less interesting than the seminars. But um, if you are into uh, seeing someone struggle, then that probably is prime content for you. Everything that I do is uh, uh, in the brand of Sherkovic. So you just um, uh, write my name on Twitter. I'll pop up. Uh, I have a YouTube channel where I put the seminars uh, with a big delay because I'm terrible at editing video. Uh, but you can go there. And yeah, obviously, I'm on Twitch uh, for the streaming again as Sherkovic. Okay, I'll I'll make sure to put a link to 17lands.com and a link to your Twitter uh, in the show notes for people that want to follow along. And uh, thanks again for coming along. Um, we'll see you. We'll see you on the next one. According to Luis, he he cleared you for takeoff, so you made it. <laughs> that was a close one. Yeah. yeah. Um, really if close, you want to find yeah. us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com. Don't forget that the show is brought to you by Channel Fireball. Make sure you check them out for any of your holiday needs, magic related. Uh, you can even find stuff uh, from Pokemon and Flesh and Blood over there too. If you've got friends or family members who are into those games and make sure you use the checkout code LR uh, when, you, when you check out. The show is also brought to you by FTX. That's a place to go for all of your digital asset needs. FTX.us in the United States and FTX.com outside. And uh, just make sure that you uh, consult a, uh, a professional advisor of uh, investment, investment advisor before you do investments of any kind. That's going to do it for this episode of LR. We'll see you next time. So on the subject of uh, alchemy and digital cards, I tweeted out a question uh, yesterday about a card called Grizzled Huntmaster. Oh, God, I don't know how it works. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, you know what this card is, I read it. I listened to two <laughs> podcasts that mentioned the card. I still have no idea what yeah, you want to do. I, I, I read your scary. tweet, and I read the card like four times, Luis. I really wanted to be the clever one who figured it out, and I just couldn't. I okay, don't know so what the heck it does. one green green. It's a 4-3 human warrior. When Grizzled Huntmaster enters the battlefield, you may exile a creature card from your hand. If you do, search your hand and library for any number of cards with the same name, exile them, then shuffle. Choose a creature card you own from outside the game. Conjure a duplicate of that card into your hand for each card exiled from your hand this way. Would either of you gentlemen like to take a guess? Right. I, I think that if I would guess, it's like you have some creatures in your sideboard as a toolbox. You play this, you exile some card that you don't want to have, and maybe a second copy of it, and then you get two copies of something from your sideboard in your hand. Is that? And what about the cards from your deck? You can get thin your deck. They don't matter, but you can thin your deck because you had some... Yeah, that's the part I don't get because it says you exile them from your deck, so I would assume that you would get copies of those as well, but like... You don't, do you? I, I guess that you want to play it with seven dwarves, and then you can have seven copies of something. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so you basically you basically want to do it only once, but you have want to have four copies, so you have a chance of having two cards exiled. Right? So there's a couple things going on here, and why I brought this up. First of all, you're correct. That is the way the card works. If you cast this and your hand has Atlantawar Elves, you can exile the Atlantawar Elves and get a card from your sideboard. You can also choose to exile three more Atlantawar Elves from your deck. And you get nothing for that except you won't draw land or elves. So, but if you had uh, two land or elves in your hand, you get two copies. Yes. yes. If you yeah. had two land or elves in your hand, you get two copies from your sideboard. So, my question, and this is why I tweeted, was why does it let you go through your deck and exile these cards? Is it just to thin your deck? Is it like I don't I don't really get it. So I, don't I got either. a couple. I got some interesting answers. One 
and was an answer from Dave Humphreys, who was one of the designers of these cards. Like he was the lead on this or, or worked on it. I don't know if he's literally the lead, but he, he answered with authority. And he said, initially, we made you exile all the copies from your deck as well to get you that sideboarding feel, like where you sideboarded out all your Lanor Elves or you sideboarded out, you know, all your whatevers and for something else. But then after playtesting feedback, we decided, oh, it wasn't that fun to all to have to exile until we gave you the option. So, yes, that is why it is. First of all, I just completely disagree with that logic in that my my experience with this card so far has been nobody really knows what it does. <laughs> and when you learn what it does, you're baffled why you can exile cards from your deck. I don't think it's particularly fun to exile these cards from your deck, even if maybe it makes your deck a little bit better. You, it's not like... If you just printed it where you can exile the cards from your hand, that would make a lot of sense. I think that's the cleanest implementation of an already complicated card. It currently has seven lines of text. It's not mm. you the, the way I described this on stream was every time for every word in your text box, the marginal cost of the next one is higher. Mm. So once you're at five lines of text, getting two more lines of text on there costs you a lot. You yeah. you really should only do that if you have to, and you do not have to for this. The second part of my point here is the number of people who confidently told me I didn't understand the card and offered their incorrect interpretations of the card <laughs> was vast. There was a lot oh of people. No, what you're missing is you can get four copies when you exile four cards from your deck. Oh, I think you're missing. It's a drawback. You have to exile the cards. Neither of those things are true. There were other <laughs> misunderstandings as well. And what really stood out to me was the confidence that these people had that I didn't know what the card did and was asking a dumb question, which obviously people ask dumb questions all the time. I'm one of those people. My confidence level to correct someone on Twitter is like a little higher than that, especially if it's someone who presumably has read a magic card in his time. So it, <laughs> it's interesting to me, kind of like the thought process. I, I do know people love correcting people. Well, I think, you know, I mean, we're, we're all there to some degree. Yeah. Isn't that just the classic Dunning-Kruger effect? Yes, it yes. exactly is. It is the classic. So at the end of the day, I think this card's text box is much worse than it could be. It could just be cleaner and more understandable. It is not understandable. There was a Twitter thread where uh, some Magic pros were trying to figure out what this card did, and one got the card wrong like three times. Like, <laughs> And it's not like their fault as much as this card's text fault. And then the second half is... If you're going to correct someone, like try to be right. Like it's it, it's a bad look to try to correct someone and, and then also just still completely be wrong. So, which I thought was funny. I it didn't bother me. I found it a lot of fun. It was really it was some interesting research on my part. What happens when you put this card online? It's like, well, people are going to really misinterpret it, and uh, <laughs> they're happy to tell you about that fact. 